you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 17. That is where we're going to be. And like I said, over the past, uh, past few weeks, we've been talking about how Jesus resurrected from the dead. And if he resurrected from the dead, and that is true, what the Bible says about Jesus is true. I will warn you, I woke up at 3 a.m. this morning and drove back from Ohio. So I am like totally exhausted, absolutely exhausted. But uh, I had a great time in Ohio. We were able to get away for a few days. I uh, uh, got to visit with my friends and kind of visit my hometown. And so uh, we, we drove back this morning. We wanted to be here with our church family. So we're really glad to be here with you. But whenever I'm on the road, right, and whenever you're driving, you always drive with people. Everyone else is insane except for me. Does anybody else feel like that when you're on the road? And I have certain pet peeves that really bother me, like when people get in my way. <laughs> so uh, I definitely drive under the speed limit, okay, because I'm a Christian. That's what we do. Uh, yeah, right, right. Nobody drives under the speed limit, right? Anybody drive under the speed limit actually driving? No? Okay, you're awesome. So anyways, <laughs> anyways, hey, nine, you're fine. You know what I'm saying? That's what the Bible says. But uh, it doesn't say that. All right. So there are certain pet peeves that we have. Like, for instance, a couple weeks ago, Angel really made fun of me because whenever I'm preaching and I kind of start rushing, I make up words. You ever do that? So I meant to say extravagant and elaborate, and I said elavigant. Okay, that's a new word we're going to use here on Sunday morning, elavigant. It's like an upgraded view of extravagant. But Angel sometimes, she's a really encourager. She views me, Angel's my wife, she views me as much better than what I am. But every once in a while, when I make up words from the stage, she has to let me know. Well, there, there are pet peeves that we have, and here's what I want you to do, okay? If you've been a member of this church, you can get out your phone or a little note card and just write down briefly some of the things that drive you absolutely nuts about our church. Really weird. I know. I'm asking you to do that. If you're uncomfortable doing that because you're afraid your neighbor's going to see, then just think of them in your mind and hold them right there. If this is your first time with us, Maybe you've had a church experience before, and there are certain pet peeves that you cannot stand about the churches that you've been in. Or maybe you've never been in a church, and this is your first time here. We're really glad that you're here. But maybe even you yourself have pet peeves about what it's like to go to church and be around Christians. Okay? So you got those things in your mind that really, really bother you? If there's nothing, you're awesome. But we all have those. Now, here's what I want you to do. If you have those things that really, really bother you in church, I want you to think, do I have a scriptural reason to be upset about this? Is there a Bible verse that I can point to that substantiates my annoyance or me being upset? In the church, you will find it is made up of broken people, right? People get on each other's nerves. It's like your own family. I mean, you guys sometimes drive each other nuts. It was really nice getting away this weekend, by the way. Our kids stayed at the house with our in-laws. Angel and I got away. We went bowling. I won't tell you who won, but I did. And it was awesome, right? I mean, here we are. Like, my bedtime's like 8.30, okay? 8.30, 9 o'clock, I want to get some sleep. And we went bowling at 9 o'clock. Living the extravagant life, you know what I'm saying? Excuse me, a lavagant life. <laughs> but, uh, but it was great. But sometimes we drive each other nuts, right? We have pet peeves, things that bother us. Well, when it comes to the church, when it comes to doing life together, sometimes we can let the things that bother us, and we don't really have a biblical reason why, get under our skin and divide the church, break us apart. And it's when we allow those non-biblical things to divide the church, that we find ourselves in trouble. Well, believe it or not, 2,000 years ago, the night before Jesus was arrested, he was on his knees praying a very specific prayer for you and for me. Somehow, God in the flesh was able to supernaturally experience in his omnipotence and omniscience, you and I, as individual members of the body of Christ, and he prayed for us specifically. Isn't that incredible? And I want to read to you this morning what it was that he prayed for us. And the question that you have to answer before you leave here today is, are you helping answer Jesus' prayer, or are you a hindrance to Jesus' prayer? So let's read John chapter 17, starting in verse 20. Here's what it says. If you don't have a Bible, we have it up on the screen for you. If you really want to read a Bible, we've got free ones out at the Welcome Center. You can just take one or take two, however many you want. We'd love for them all to be gone today. So John chapter 17, verse 20 is what we're going to read. Here's what it says. Jesus had just got done praying for his disciples. And it says in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, these disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. 
What is their word? The apostles' doctrine, the Bible that we have. That they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that you have sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and that you have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they who also you have given me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world, before time even existed, love between the Father and the Son. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus prays one of the most powerful prayers ever recorded in the New Testament. And it was a prayer of unity. It was a prayer of oneness. It was a prayer of love. And Jesus was praying for his disciples. And he knew the world that they were going to enter in as they boldly proclaimed the word of God. And he asked God to protect them and to keep them strong and doctrinally sound. And then he shifts a moment in history and he starts thinking about you and I. That we would believe, even though we never saw Jesus, that we would believe because of the word that they preached. You see, the nature of the oneness that Jesus talks about, he uses this example. If you'll look in verses 21 and 23, he says, Father, I pray that they may be one just as we are one. And when you think about the nature of the relationship between the Father and the Son, the primary foundation of that relationship is holiness. The relationship between God the Father and God the Son and the Trinity is one of holiness, and it's also one of love. And so when Jesus talks about this oneness, he wants the church to exist in such a way that is unified on holy living and loving each other. That is the nature of the oneness that God has set out. And think about the purpose. Why does God want us to be one? Well, he specifically says in 21 and 23, he says that the world may believe the Father has sent the Son. And that the world may know the Father sent Jesus and loves them. I mean, think about that. When we talk about who Jesus was, Jesus was somebody who wanted to be accessible. Jesus was somebody who was merciful and graceful and humble. And Jesus really, really cared about unity in the church. He really, really cared about how we treat each other and how we love each other. And so the question that I challenge you in this passage of Scripture is this. If, do our actions point to the love and the unity of God? Do they point to his truth? Do they point to his grace? Or are we serving as a hindrance to people knowing those things about God? One of the reasons why people, frankly, don't like church is because of the people in it, right? Big deal. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is the church. This is who we are. And nine times out of ten, anytime I talk about people coming to church, they say, man, I just can't stand the people that go there. And I say, I exactly know what you're talking about. No, I don't say that. That would be really mean, right? <laughs> Look, we're messy. I know the reason why people don't like to come to church has a part to do with me. Why? Because I am a sinner and I make mistakes. But there are certain things in our lives and our attitudes and our actions that we can control. How we treat each other and how we love each other. And that's the challenge that Jesus presents to us this morning. And so Jesus wants us to have oneness. That they may be one. And look at the reason. Look at verse 24. He says, Father, I desire that they be one. And look at the purpose. That they may behold my glory which you have given me. One of the reasons why Jesus wants us to be one is so that people can see Jesus as he truly is. You know, the only Bible or the only message that people often hear is us. How we talk with each other. How we treat the world how we treat and love ourselves. And sometimes people don't want to even pick up the Bible, but they'll listen to you, they'll watch you, they'll hear you and see you, and how you act and what you do is the loudest message that you could ever preach to the people around you. And so what is at stake with the oneness of Jesus? Well, it's pretty, pretty simple. The glory of God. 
And it is our oneness. It is our love for each other and our unity that shares that message. So here's the challenge. Here's the issue. If we are divided over things that don't matter, and if we do not love one another, do people have an accurate view of who God is? And the answer is no. We are his message. We are his workmanship. And so God wants us to be one that we would uh, not only share his glory, but he also says this, that they may be with me where I am going. Here's another thing at stake. Not only how we treat each other and the image that we give about Jesus, but even our eternal destiny. There can come a point, and this is what I say, it is really, really difficult to lose your salvation. We as a church, one of the doctrinal beliefs that we do hold is that you are not uh, once saved, always saved. That's, that's something that we don't believe because we don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. Galatians chapter 5 verse 4 says, if you turn to another manner of salvation, aka in the context circumcision, you have fallen from grace. If you try to get saved by being circumcised or keeping the works of the law, you are now under the law system. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 through 6 is very, very clear. If we who were once enlightened and we've tasted the heavenly gift of God and we turn away from that and we reject it and we say, I no longer believe that Jesus is Lord, we can forfeit and give up our salvation. But it's really, really hard to get there, right? And I have not met too many people who have reached that point. It takes a lot of hard work of disobedience to reach a point of disbelief. But the entire book of Hebrews is serving one point. Don't disobey to the point where you no longer believe that Jesus is Lord, right? And so what's at stake is simply this. If we divide against one another and we point the finger and we argue over things that simply aren't found in the Bible, we can reach such a discouraged point in our lives where we just say, you know what, I give up, I'm done with this. If the church is all about fighting and arguing over things that really don't matter, I don't want to be a part of that. And then the message that's shared with people who have never been to church is, all people do is fight and argue. Why would I want to be a part of that? And so you can see what's at stake here. Not only the glory of God and who Jesus is, but also where we're going to spend eternity. We are in this together, and we should be fighting for each other, not against each other. That's the message that Jesus preaches here. That's the message that he prays. Thirdly, what's most important is this. When we are one, we understand that we are loved by the Father. I'd like to read to you a scripture in 1 John chapter 4, if you'll turn there with me. It's at the end of the New Testament. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, otherwise known as the big gospel of John. And then you have these little epistles in the back of the Bible, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And John wrote these letters to the church. And he says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, he says this, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the exchange, the payment for our sins. Look what he says in verse 9. In this the love of God was made manifest towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. The whole point of Jesus coming down here and praying for us is that we would be in contact with the love of God. And here's the challenge. Are we hindering people through our actions from accessing that love over arguing of things that do not matter? That's the question. I don't know about you, but I pray that God rids me of all things that do not matter to him and that are not founded in his word and that I would speak where the Bible speaks and give Christian liberty where the Bible was silent. That is the method and the mode of Jesus' unity. And so simply it comes down to this. We have two objectives this morning. Our duties for Jesus, number one, are to walk in unity. To walk and live in unity. To be unified together. To be whole. To be one unit. And man, I have never lost a limb, thankfully. Right, that would be really terrible, right? But there are some people in here. Lose legs, lose fingers, lose arms. I mean, it's tough. And when you lose a part of your body, it not only hurts, but you always live life as if something has been missing. And that is the picture and the image of what it's like when the church is unified and then a part of it leaves. Whether they get upset in the church or you've been hurt or life is just getting so busy, we need each other and you all matter. You're important here. You are a part of the body, even sometimes if you don't want to be. And so the challenge that God has given us is that we should walk in unity. Now, something that I've noticed with Piper, right, my daughter Piper, she's two and a half years old. 
And sometimes she'll want certain things like chocolate. I don't know where she gets her love for sweets from. You know what I mean, right? Guys, I ate a donut out of the trash two weeks ago, okay? I shared that story with you all in humility. If this is your first time here, you have to go and watch the video. Not getting into it again, okay? It's pretty embarrassing. But uh, anyways, so she gets her love for sweets from me. Like, I just eat sugar pretty much 24-7. And uh, it's terrible, I know. It's bad. But anyways, so sometimes she'll want things from me, and I'll tell her no, and she'll go running and screaming, and she'll throw herself down, and she'll cry and go to mommy. What's she trying to do? Little stinkers trying to divide and conquer. She didn't get it from dad. She's hoping to throw a fit that mommy would give in and give it to her. And for those of you who are parents, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I know it gets even more challenging once they can speak and have words, right? Well, believe it or not, sometimes people do that in the church. They'll come to me and they'll ask me for something or about something. I'll give them an answer. And then that's what they do. It's crazy. A full-grown adult. They'll actually go to an elder or another leader, not tell them that they went to me, but they'll ask the exact same question, hoping for a different answer. And they do it. It happens all the time. They do it to the same thing. They'll go to the elders. They'll get the question. And if they don't get the answer they want, they come to me. I mean, it is human nature, right? You're at work wherever. We want what we want, and sometimes we'll divide and conquer in order to get that. And we really have to fight against that. When the Bible talks about walking in unity, it gives us a challenge in Ephesians chapter 4. I'd like to read it to you. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. Again, if not, it's up on the screen. But Paul was writing to this church in Ephesus, and they were struggling uh, with division. They were made up of a church of Jews and Gentiles, and so they had different cultures, different pet peeves, different things that they liked and disliked. But there are some things that we can be unified on. And so if we can have the maturity to put down the things that we necessarily don't like or do like as pet peeves, and if we can unify together on the essentials, we can have traction and being unified for Jesus. Look at what he says here in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. He says, There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. It is absolutely important to be doctrinally unified as a church. Absolutely important. And unfortunately, a lot of people, even those who claim to be followers of Jesus, use John chapter 17 in an attempt to rid ourselves of what the Bible teaches about truth, about these seven things that unify us. And so we as a Christian church, our pledge and our plea is that we would be unified in the oneness of God through doctrinal unity first and foremost. You read about different baptisms in the church. Well, now there's only one. And you, if you want to be a Christian, you've got to choose which baptism you're going to have. The Christian baptism of Acts 2.38 or a denominational baptism that developed through church history and through false teaching. One Lord, one faith, one God. I mean, that is doctrinal oneness. And so we must really strive and stand firm in grace, but also in truth, on doctrinal unity in the church. But not only on doctrinal unity should we have uh, that strong effort with, but also ethical unity. There are certain behaviors in the church and people that we should absolutely not have. There is a certain red line that Jesus draws in the sand. You're either for me or against me. And we as Christians must be willing to stand strong when it comes to the ethical unity of the church. There are some behaviors that should really be encouraged. And you can read about those in Galatians chapter 5, as well as some behaviors that should really be discouraged. Galatians chapter 5, verse 20, it lists this word dissensions, divisions in the church. It says it's a sin of the flesh. And it goes on to say those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Unity matters. Unity is important. Are you helping Jesus in answering his prayer, or are you hindering Jesus in answering his prayer? We have to have unity of the mind. If you'll bear with me this morning, we're going to read about five Bible verses on the warning of division, because it's, it's really that important. And the first one I'd like to read to you is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. The early church, just like the church today, man, we're, 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 we're sinners, right? We're made up of broken people. Obviously, people are going to disagree and get their feelings hurt. It happens. But there are certain lines that we should not cross. One of the problems in the early church, specifically here in, in the church at Corinth, 
is they were arguing over who was more important because of who baptized them. Some of them were baptized by Paul, really important guy, that would be kind of cool. Some of them were baptized by Apollos, another very powerful preacher of the word. Paul was more of an intellect, he was a great, uh, had a great mind, uh, not a very good speaker. Apollos was a really good speaker. I mean, he could preach the pants off of a sermon. I mean, he was great. So they had these two strengths and they both had their weaknesses. Well, in the early church, they started fighting for prominence and people said, well, I follow Apollos because he baptized me. And other people said, well, I follow Paul because he baptized me. And look at what Paul says to them in verse 10 of chapter 1. He says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, with the same judgment. When it comes to the ethics of the church, he says, I want you guys to have the same attitude. What is the grounds for our ethics in the church? The word of God. Your pet peeves that you have in the church, is there a scriptural support for it? Is there a biblical ground for the reason why things might happen in the church that you necessarily don't like or that rub you the wrong way? And if there's not, be silent. There's no need to share. You can have those for yourself, and that's fine. You have your convictions. But we should not be placing our convictions on other people. Doctrinal unity and ethical unity. Divisions in the church, as I said, it happened then, and it happens now. And we have to fight for each other. Let me read to you a few other passages of Scripture. Romans chapter 16. Just look right to the next book. Look what he says here. He's saying goodbye to the Roman church. Paul's writing to them. And in verses 17 and 18, Paul says this. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine of which you learned. And do what? Avoid them. Man, you got people who are always causing division and turning people against each other. And this is practical. At work, in your family, just stay away. I can honestly say this. My wife and I can attest that one of the things that have kept us strong in the faith is staying away from people who are relentless about causing division. Gossip, malicious talk, mean-spiritedness, always having to give their opinion about pet peeves. Man, you see people like that, run the other way. Just avoid them because doctrine matters. What you believe about truth will affect the way that you live. Look what else he goes on to say in verse 18. He says, for those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but what? Their own belly, their own appetites. What pleases them? And by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Some things do sound good. Some things do sound, man, that actually sounds kind of right. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to death. And there can be truths that we hold in our heart that feel so real and so right, but when we open up the word of God and we examine it, we find out that they're false. And so everything that we say and do as a church must be grounded and founded in the word of God. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 16. Turn with me to Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Titus is a young man in the faith. His, his job that he's tasked with is to go around to different cities and build churches, plant churches of people, put elders in charge. And guess what? People are messy. And so Paul's writing to this young man. He's encouraging him. He's uplifting him. And look what he says in chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. He says, Reject a divisive man after the first and second warning, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning and being self-condemned. People causing division in the church or even in your own families. And you go and you say, hey, look, man, this isn't what God wants for us. He doesn't want us split apart. He wants us unified together. And then you go to a second time because they keep doing it. You say, look, man, this is what the Bible says. What's going on here? Why are, why are you dividing yourself against the church or other people? And after that, the message that you get is very, very clear. There is nothing that you can say or do to help a person who's committed to chaos. There's nothing that you can do. They're toxic people. That's why I love mothers so much. Mothers have a mother's love and they fight to keep their family together. Sometimes as men, we get discouraged. Sometimes we can lose our emotions and we can just go on our, our thoughts and what makes rational sense. But the moms come in on Mother's Day and they fight for their family because nothing is more important than keeping the family together. 
They're fearless. They love their children. They love their families, their spouses. And that's the kind of love that we should have for the church. Fighting to keep one another together. But there are some times when people are just so committed to division, you have to let them go. And it's the toughest thing that you can do. But again, be unified doctrinally and ethically. The last one that I'd like for us to turn to is 1 John chapter 2. Again, John's writing to the church. And he deals with this heartbreak. When people leave the church, it's one of the toughest things that you can go through as a minister, uh, as an eldership, or just even as a brother in the Christ. And look what happens here. Some people are leaving the church because they're getting caught up in things that are false. But they have a commitment issue. He says in verse 19, he says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if, if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. I think the sad reality is, is that sometimes people leave the church because they were never committed in the first place. It was a place to hang out. It was a place, maybe you came here for a spouse or for a family member, or maybe it was just something you were checked out, checking out. The sad reality is that sometimes people leave the church because they were never committed in the first place. And this stuff is tough. And this hits home. I have people in my own family who have left the church. I have people that are my friends that have left the church. I have people that have been here for a very long time, and they leave the church. And in the 10 years of ministry, there have been a lot of people who have been hurt, and they've just left. And it wrecks you to the core. But at the end of the day, we have to fight for unity. We have to fight for love and togetherness. That's the prayer of Jesus. Are you helping answering the prayer of Jesus? Or are you hindering answering the prayer of Jesus? That's the challenge for you this morning. The Bible says we're not only to walk in unity, but as I said, we are to walk in love. And we could sit here all day and we could talk about how we are supposed to love God and love people. Some people went up to Jesus and they said, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus' response was this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And when Paul describes love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. It does not keep records of wrong. I mean, sometimes as husbands and wives, you can hold on to stuff, right? Remember 30 years ago when we were at the restaurant and you yelled at me in front of, I mean, it's crazy, but we hold on to stuff. But if we truly love each other, we won't look into the past to deal with the present. We won't hold on to those past hurts. The Bible says love is long-suffering. Think about that. I ask people, what does it mean to be long-suffering? Self-explanatory, to suffer for long, <laughs> right? And we suffer with each other. I mean, there are things that I, I do that bother Angel, and they bothered her for the last 10 years. But she doesn't leave me. Why? We're family. We made a commitment. We love each other. That's what the Bible teaches about love. Walking with each other in unity. Walking with each other in love. We need to love each other, and we need to love God. And so are you doing your part to see that the prayer of Jesus is answered? That's the question for you. I'd like to end with a story. There was a Russian guy whose name I can't pronounce, <laughs> but I've got a picture for you. And many of you might know who he is. We actually have some Russian linguists in here, so I'm sure you'll send me an email, come up afterwards, let me know what his name is, but that's okay. This guy was a captain, one of three captains on a submarine during the Cold War. And it was October 27th, 1960s, that he was actually around Cuba, as many of you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he had a nuclear bomb inside of his, of his submarine. This is a true story. And so as you know, the Cold, the Cold War began to progress, really scary, You're on the brink of war. Anything could happen, all it would take would be one conflict that would erupt and everything would go crazy, right? People start shooting each other, bombs going off, nuclear bombs literally being launched. And so they're around Cuba and there are some warships from the United States that are coming in and they're dropping shock bombs around the area, USS warships. And as a captain, he believes with the other two that they are under attack and World War III has started. And they're equipped with this nuclear bomb Two of the three captains want to launch it at one of the U.S. warships. And you could only imagine what would happen. You launch that missile, it hits that warship, 
the mushroom cloud goes up, World War III starts, and who knows how many people would have died and have been hurt. But there was one guy, one of the three captains on that ship, who tried to calm people down, the other two captains, and said, hey, wait, let's think about this for a minute. If we launch this missile, it could really be the end of the world as we know it. And we don't know for sure if World War III has actually happened. And it took all three captains in agreement in order to launch this missile. And he disagreed. Little did he know that he wasn't being targeted, their submarine, they didn't even know that was there. And because he refused to launch the missile, he was able to preserve peace. And after he died, he was given an award for preserving that peace. And the truth is, is that we all have the ability to launch missiles. And we can cause pain and hurt in our families, at our jobs, and our schools, and our churches. And we need people who are peacemakers. We need mothers who are willing. Let's just wait a second. Let's have peace. We need fathers who are willing to stand up and just calm everybody down. Let's have peace. We need leaders in the church and Christians who are willing to say, let's just wait to launch that missile until we figure out what's going on. Let's have peace. Because life and togetherness is far much more important than retaliation and causing hurt with other people. And so I want to encourage you this morning to think about the prayer of Jesus as a mom, as a dad, And maybe today, think about all those moments where your family has stuck together and not been torn apart. And rejoice in those moments. That here you are with your family, with the people that love each other, and you're going to fight for each other and remain together. Not only as your own family, but as the family of God. I'd like to... Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty.